my name is Marion Fourcade, and I am the director of UC Berkeley Social Science Matrix. And today I am really delighted to welcome you to our fourth, first Matrix on Point of the year. As you have surely noticed, if you followed our events at Matrix, we have been especially interested in the transformative effects of new technologies on various aspects of social and economic life. In the past, we have organized events centered on the public sphere, religion, money, and education, and all their intersections with digital technologies. Today, we want to address the ways these new technologies are also reshaping humanitarian work. We have invited an outstanding group of scholars to help us think about the profound implications that new practices and affordances have for conceptualizing human rights, privacy, democracy, and the efficacy of humanitarian action. We are very grateful to them for being with us. And in some cases, they are, it's very early or very late in their day, depending on where they are located. We would also like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, uh, the Human Rights Center at Berkeley Law and the UC Berkeley School of Information. Now, I would like to introduce our moderator, Laura Fletcher is clinical professor of law at UC Berkeley School of Law, where she directs the International Human Rights Law Clinic. She's active in the areas of human rights, humanitarian law, international criminal justice, and transitional justice. And as director of the International Human Rights Law Clinic, Professor Fletcher utilizes an interdisciplinary problem-based approach to human rights research advocacy and policy. So we couldn't have a better moderator for today's panel. And uh, without further ado, let me now turn it over to Laurel. Thank you for doing this. And I really look forward to the whole event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marvin. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to moderate this first panel in the Matrix on Point series. When I started thinking about this, I was struck first by how obvious the theme of today's panel is and how we've come to accept that technology has and will continue to change, not just how human rights are protected or advanced, but also what and how we conceptualize human rights themselves. Without the internet and cyber technologies, we don't have algorithms from which we need protection or which we can actually use right, to protect human rights. Without the internet, activists cannot connect instantaneously with an international audience to disseminate information. And thus our conception of the right to information has expanded because of changes in technology. These were not questions that the human rights movement considered much, if at all, even just 10 years ago. I remember when the NGO Witness was founded in 1992 its aim was to equip local activists with the tools to document human rights violations in real time, right? That sounds so important. What were those tools? Wait for it, video cameras, right? Like video cameras with real film. And I remember thinking, mm, that's kind of catchy, but it's never gonna take on. We're gonna continue to use pen and paper and go to the field and take our interviews. And that's how we're gonna document, right? How quaint. Then came Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. And human rights began to change its relationship to technology. Activists, academics, technology industry leaders reached out in new ways to each other to get a handle on how technology was impacting human rights for good and for ill. So RightsCon, the major international human rights and technology conference, which first convened in just 2011 with 400 participants, last year had more than 9,000 attend. So I think this all points to the pace of change and the human rights movement's attention to the impacts of technology are accelerating. 10 years ago, the Human Rights Clinic did a project with the Human Rights Center on how to introduce digital evidence before the international court. At that time, that was our first project in the Human Rights Clinic that centered on technology and human rights. So 
So fast forward to our docket today. We released last year a 10 country study exclusively of digital violations, study of how um, the online right to freedom of expression had been violated in 10 different countries. We work on illegal electronic surveillance of human rights defenders. And the documentation these days of human rights violations comes first and foremost through Twitter. So technology touches literally every aspect of our human rights docket and how we do and think about our work. So it's against this background that I'm so pleased to introduce our panelists and begin our discussion on humanitarian technologies. Our speakers will illuminate current issues in the field enriched by their deep expertise. I will introduce our panelists in the order in which they will speak. So first, Fleur Johns is professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at UNSW Sydney, working in international law, legal theory, and law and technology. She is also an Australian Research Council Fellow and in from 2021 to 2024, a visiting professor at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. She's published four books and has a forthcoming monogram with Oxford University Press entitled Hashtag Help, Digital Humanitarianism and the Remaking of International Order. Our second speaker is Dara Murray, is a senior lecturer at the University of Essex Human Rights Center and School of Law. He was recently awarded a UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship for the project, What Does Artificial Intelligence Mean for the Future of Democratic Society? Examining the social impact of AI and whether human rights can respond. You can't get more topical than that, Dara. <laughs> this four year interdisciplinary project began in January 2020 with the project, and the project team will draw on the expertise of human rights law, sociology, and philosophy. Dara's research expertise is in international human rights law and the law of armed conflict, and he has a specific interest in artificial intelligence and other advanced technologies. And finally, Wendy Wong studies global governance. She's particularly attentive to how non-state actors, for those of you, uh, I wanna de-jargon this. Um, so non-state actors are non-governmental organizations, civil society actors, social movements, and corporations, how all of those players govern at the global and domestic level. Her areas of interest are emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, big data, human rights, and humanitarian assistance. Dr. Wong has written two award-winning books, penned dozens of peer-reviewed articles and chapters, and is currently professor of political science at the University of British Columbia, uh, Okanagan, um, which is the uh, Silex Okanagan Nation Territory, and principal's research chair. She's currently on leave from the University of Toronto, where she is a Canadian research in global governance and civil society and professor of political science. So with that, let's start with our first panelist, Flora Johns. Thank you so much, Laurel. And thanks to you and to Marin for the um, introduction and invitation to be part of this discussion and Julia Cizek and Chuck for putting together things behind the scenes. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here speaking to you from the unceded lands of the uh, Bejigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nations in Australia. Um, so my, let me just share some slides that I'm gonna be speaking with today just to give you some of the visuals um, So I'm going to be um, sharing just a small slice of some observations and arguments that are more fully developed in the book that Laurel kindly mentioned, which is coming out in February uh, 2023, um, pictured here um, on um, digital humanitarianism and the remaking of international order. As you know, and as Laurel has already foreshadowed, um, the turn to digital technology by governments, international organizations and NGOs in, in, in uh, humanitarian practice on the international plane is a post-Cold War phenomenon. Um, and it, it takes many forms. So I, I just wanted to 
situate uh, the kinds of interfaces and, and practices that I've been focusing on. So on the left here, we have a, an image that represents the so-called space bridge to Armenia uh, that was introduced under NASA leadership in 1989 that involved a satellite mediated link up, audio fax and um, video link up between four US and two Armenian and Russian medical centers after the 1988 Armenian earthquake. And below that, we have a visual representation of Microsoft's role in 1999 in the Kosovo conflict, uh, where they um, participated with UNHCR in refugee registration on the ground, producing 100 registration kits, which you can see depicted here, which each included a laptop computer, a digital camera, and an identity card printer. So um, this, this has been ongoing for some time, but the largest image on the right here is an example of the kinds of interface that I have been studying for the past few years, namely those introduced and developed in and by international organisations for humanitarian purposes after UN member states' adoption of the um, Millennium Development Goals in 2000. And further after the adoption of the Sustainable De Development Goals in 2015, when humanitarianism came to demand more than ever data gathering and analysis using um, digital technology. So the image here is of Hunger Map Live, which is the product of a partnership between the World Food Program and the um, Alibaba Foundation that was forged in 2018. And they produced this online um, tool, uh, which produces, represents and monitors food security or rather insecurity in near real time in more than 90 countries around the world using a combination of actual data drawn from mobile phone surveying, automated surveying, or as in the case here, which um, depicts food insecurity in Senegal, uses predictions of food insecurity um, employing uh, generated from machine learning models where survey data is limited or unavailable. So this uses a machine learning model that's been trained on data drawn from 63 countries over a 14 year period to try and predict what the current state of food insecurity in various provinces of Senegal is. And I'll come back to Hunger Map Live in a moment. So the broad claim is that, um, that digital humanitarian interfaces like Hunger Map Live are not just putting new forms of quantity, quantitative and qualitative data in the hands of humanitarian professionals, but they're also transforming the humanitarian episteme. And I want to focus on one particular aspect of that transformation in the few minutes today, which is the change in the register of emergency. And this is significant because of the extent to which law and politics throughout the modern period has, as you know, been conducted in significant part in the register of emergency or emergency response. When an emergency is rendered digital or experienced through a digital interface, such as Hunger Map Live, as opposed to other formats, such as say a situation analysis by a humanitarian professional in the field, that interface changes by whom an emergency may, is considered actionable, what kind of action is invited, and when or within what time frame the emergency is understood to manifest or is contemplated. So as to the who, digital interfaces such as Hunger Map Live, in one sense, generate an impression that everyone can act in humanitarian response. Digital humanitarian interfaces such as this invite new participants into the field of humanitarian practice. And that is because interfaces such as this tend to demand data that can attest in near real time to the activities of large swathes of people and territory. And to date, 
nowhere has a more expansive infrastructure been built for the extraction, accumulation and analysis of such data than that created and controlled by commercial data platforms and device manufacturers. Accordingly, commercial actors have come to seem indispensable to contemporary efforts to confront international humanitarian emergencies. Hence, Alibaba Foundation's involvement in Hunger Map Live. Now, of course, commercial actors have for centuries been involved in humanitarian practice, but it is their centrality and indispensability that is novel. At the same time, Many digital inter humanitarian interfaces incorporate crowdsourcing elements. Although this is not a feature of Hunger Map Live, there are many other illustrations where this is prominent. And this has prompted the advent of the so-called armchair humanitarian who can participate on a voluntary basis in what we might think of as humanitarian piecework, such as labeling data as part of a humanitarian mapathon run by organizations like the Humanitarian Open Street Map team. And so this creates that impression that everyone can be a humanitarian. As uh, one of the champions of developments in this area, um, Patrick Meyer has written, all you need is a big heart and access to the internet. At the same time, these digital interfaces also create an impression that no one is directly or primarily responsible in some sense. The very profusion of data seems to yield any number of reasons why action beyond information gathering should be deferred or distributed elsewhere. There is never enough data at hand. There's always the prospect of more or improved data on the horizon that might make humanitarian response better informed, better targeted, or better received. In their perpetual incompleteness, digital humanitarian interfaces seem to offer as many reasons for people not to assume responsibility for humanitarian response as they invite new participants and forge new pathways, potential pathways for action. As to the what, Digital humanitarian interfaces are noteworthy for rendering the emergency informational. This is because they tend to frame emergency, humanitarian emergencies as problems to which they seem like solutions. And let me give you an illustration of this. This is from another UN collaboration that resulted in another online interface called Haze Gazer. This resulted from a collaboration between the UN or an initiative within the UN called UN Global Pulse and the Indonesian government, which involved um, producing a digital interface briefly uh, depicted here in, in miniature um, that mines social media and other data sources to try to understand or help the Indonesian government understand how people are affected by haze, that is serious air pollution in hotspots around the Indonesian nation. Now, having adopted over many decades policies to try to address the premature death and health problems that have long been associated with the smoke produced by peat burning and illegal logging throughout Indonesia, the Indonesian government has, in this collaboration and in producing this digital interface, which is now incorporated in the President's Situation Room in Indonesia, had, um, they have succeeded in making haze into a problem of informational deficiency on which they are demonstrably taking action by developing tools such as this, rather than a problem of, say, economic dependence on the mining and palm oil industries. So the problem becomes um, that they have not previously had sufficiently comprehensive or sufficiently timely data on how people are experiencing or suffering from the effects of haze, and this digital interface allows them to remedy that problem. So it's in this sense that the emergency is rendered informational when it is experienced and represented and analysed through a digital interface. As to the when, digital interfaces modulate the temporality of emergencies, that is the time frame within which they are perceived and analyzed. 
In the first instance, they do so by filling up the present when perceived through an interface such as humanitarian, such as um, Hunger Map Live, the emergency is forever emergent, always in the process of materialising as more data is gathered and the interface is continually updated. Users are invited by uh, interfaces such as these into a posture of chronic waiting from which the digital humanitarian interface offers some relief. It is as if the digital interface says to the user, wait, there's more to come, but I will do some of the waiting for you. I will be continually vigilant around the clock. I will assume some of the burden of this chronic waiting. As to the future, there is, of course, always a lot of talk of promise and future developments amid work on digital humanitarian interface, interfaces but this futurism tends to be foreshortened. The emphasis is overwhelmingly on tinkering with emergencies, existing or emergent elements and trying to make something of those incrementally and iteratively, a practice of endless optimization of um, current data and um, emergent data. The sheer mass of data available in near time real time or real time encourages a tendency to try to work in the near future with what you have rather than trying to change or question it. Now there is of course also an accompanying rhetoric of much longer futurism, the long-termism, although I won't speak to that now. I'm happy to address that in Q&A if um, people are interested. As one of my interviewees engaged in humanitarian interface development put it, the basis of our approach, and I'm quoting now from an interviewee, the basis of our approach is incrementality. You only build the increments that you know aren't being built and you never build ahead. So let's go back to Hunger Map Live to get a sense of the way in which the um, emergency is being um, rendered uh, in these new forms and the, the humanitarian interface sorry, the humanitarian episteme is being transformed. The emergency space that Hunger Map Live invites its users to inhabit is that of a relentlessly perilous present. It narrows the decision-making aperture to direct attention towards measures that might move selected subnational zones from red to green in near real time. Although the interface combines different temporalities, because the machine learning inputs are reported at different intervals, some weekly, some quarterly, some annually, Hunger Map Live compresses these into the near real time on which it places emphasis. It is this that is made data rich and spectacular and is thereby given precedence. Unlike many humanitarian communications in the past, Hunger Map Live does not depict the hungry on a journey towards improvement over the longer term. And likewise, what is resolutely placed beyond per the purview of this digital interface and others like it is any wholesale evaluation of systems of global food production and distribution or any critical scrutiny of their law and pol policy ramparts. Watching and waiting is above all the activity that th this digital interface and others like it encourage. Data offers a palliative for the present not a program. And humanitarian interfaces are made cyclical and recurrent by these interfaces and therefore demanding of continual vigilance. No longer is the emergency that which suspends or interrupts time, as has been the case throughout the modern period in law and politics. Rather, the crisis situation comes to signify or occupy the dead time of waiting. What, what, waiting, watching, and keeping ourselves informed. Now, why does this matter? It matters because of the enormously consequential constitutive impact of emergency thinking and practice on law and politics. As Bonnie Honig and many others have observed, much of contemporary democratic theory, politics, and law have been shaped by invocations of emergency. If the emergency is being understood differently through its digitization, 
then the range of legal and political possibilities and, and patterns of thinking that appear open or actionable are being reshaped accordingly. And as a final point that I'm happy to take up in Q&A if people are interested, what is especially noteworthy about the nature of this change is that it is not taking place through explicit argument about what is or isn't important or principled or valuable or worthy of prioritizing, but rather through shifts in practice, investment and technology. So this is a use-led transformation, not an ideas or argument-driven one, although there are, of course, arguments and ideas at play too. So I would argue that it needs to be met or tackled not through persuasion primarily, but through counter use. But I can say more about that in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, I will stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Flora. Um, absolutely fascinating. And I could, I, I've got to read the book. Okay, so let, let's know how we can order it. Um, so speaking of Q&A, um, thank you for the plug, um, Flora. Yes. All of you participants out there, I've got like a gazillion questions right now, but we wanna hear from you. So please use the Q&A feature so that we can have a nice um, robust queue going for our discussion. Um, but before we get there, I'm gonna turn it to Dara Murray to, uh, to present your, uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank you all very much for having me. It's really nice to be here. I am, I'm sorry, I'm coming to you from a horror show. I'm in London and I haven't been uh, in the office this late ever. So I was totally unaware about what the light, the light was like um, so far. Apologies that it looks a bit strange. Um, I think my talk might map quite nicely after Fleur's. Um, to be honest, I found it quite difficult to prepare a topic for this talk, partially because it's past my bedtime and I was worried about being incoherent, which I still am. But also, this is such a huge area, you know, where do you start with tech and humanitarian action? Um, but Julia gave us a prompt when she was um, inviting us to the talk, and she said to think of something in our, in our research that surprised us um, and talk about that. And for me, I'm okay, came across something in my work that, that shocked me. Um, and so I want to talk about that, although I won't name any names. Essentially, a few years ago, I was on a, a high-level panel with um, about tech and humanitarian action with a number of very senior UN representatives of UN agencies, representatives of humanitarian organizations and so on. And the focus was on using advanced technologies to facilitate uh, humanitarian assistance. What shocked me was the implicit understanding that because their intentions were good, um, that that was sufficient. And there was really inadequate, inadequate consideration given either to the need to adopt new technology or its potential impact. And I know that that might not be too exceptional, but it was pretty shocking given the specific context that we're in. You know, inevitably a more critical, critical approach has been adopted in the years since, um, but it did get me thinking about how to evaluate potential harm in a humanitarian context. And that's what I would talk about today. So specifically, I'd like to focus on what a due diligence framework might look like for humanitarian actors and in proposing this framework, I draw on international human rights law as my discipline, but also work um, I've done in other sectors like policing. Uh, sorry, make sure my slides work. Yep. I'll start with a few assumptions. Um, and the first is that the do no harm principle is a good thing, but it's often more difficult than we think. And I think this is something that we fail to acknowledge sufficiently. Um, planning, um, anticipating impacts, is really, really very difficult, particularly in this context, you know, in an, in an advanced technology context, as we're often dealing with something new. It is the case that in some cases, tech will straightforwardly replace older analog processes, but in other cases, um, particularly when advanced analytics are involved, we're entering into a new era. You know, we're doing something entirely, entirely new. And what that means is that we don't understand or know the full implications of what we're doing particularly as some of those implications may be almost imperceptible um, in the short term, but very profound in the long term. Uh, an example might be digital surveillance. And so what will the impact of digital and so traceable cash be on um, the informal sectors? You know, we're populations reliant on informal sectors in the informal economy to make 
uh, to make ends meet and to survive in a humanitarian context? And then how does the introduction of digital technology affect that? Uh, the second is, like, I guess, an obvious point to a degree, but I'm pro-technology. Um, I'm a reformed computer scientist, so I'm very interested in technology. And I think we should absolutely be thinking about how we should use it in a humanitarian context. And we'd be irresponsible not to do so. You know, there's so much potential there that it would be it would be mad not to think how we could improve the situation. But I guess kind of building on Fleur's talk, uh, technology isn't the answer to everything. Um, sometimes traditional approaches might be good. Sometimes even though technology may improve efficiency or service delivery, the associated harms means that we just shouldn't use it. So in thinking through a due diligence framework, what I'm focused here is on thinking through uh, the initial thought process. So in a pre-deployment or a pre-design or development of technology context, what are the things that we should take into consideration to ensure that we develop technology in a, well, for want of a better word, in a human rights compliant manner? Um, and if the decision is made to deploy, what safeguards should we take into place? How should we, um, how should we approach it? You know, how should we circumscribe the circumstances of use? The framework itself is based on human rights law, but human rights law does not apply straightforwardly as a matter of international law to non-state actors and to huma uh, humanitarian organizations or international organizations. But I think we can all agree that humanitarian, humanitarian actors shouldn't be involved in human rights violations. So from my perspective, it's no harm to look to human rights law for guidance. And a lot of ways, this is similar to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, where it's recognized that although there might not be a legal obligation on businesses and corporations, there is an expectation on the part of the international community that these actors will respect human rights. Um, and if nothing else, it's good PR. The other thing, um, and the second point, and apologies if I'm talking too fast, it's a national, uh, it's a national problem. Um, the second thing is that when we think of human rights though, we have a problem in the sense that human rights law typically looks at an issue after the fact. So we only receive guidance after the fact. So a case will go to court, we get a decision, and then we get a justification for that decision. But while this is important, it's not always straightforward to apply the justification underpinning an arrow after the look, after the fact look backwards to a pre-deployment decision-making process. You know, to turn it around and look forward. Um, and I think this is an important thing to recognize. I think for me, human rights law offers a framework, but it doesn't have all the answers at the moment. And so this is why we really have to think through two things at the moment at the at this time. Oops, sorry. The third uh, point, and this one is really important for me, um, because I think it's a mistake we often make when we talk about technology. I think it's really important to recognize that there's no, no one size fits all approach. Too often we think about technology, we think of it in broad terms. You know, is facial recognition good or bad? Should we use open source information for in the humanitarian context or not? Should we collect biometric data or not? And I think that this is inappropriate, the inappropriate, sorry. The potential impacts or potential harm will depend on the specificities of a deployment. Um, we can't really examine it at, at the abstract level. The use of technology should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis or a deployment-by-deployment -deployment basis. You know, an example might be, uh, say, the use of open source information from social media for predicting migration flows, which could be really useful in uh, the Mediterranean context, but really not very useful in response to a natural disaster in rural India. So onto the framework itself. Uh, as I said, this is drawn from human rights law. And essentially human rights law establishes a three-part test to determine whether an interference with the right is legitimate or whether it constitutes a violation. The three components of the test are that it must be in accordance with the law, um, it must pursue a legitimate aim, and it must be necessary in a democratic society. And I'll focus on two of those. So the first requirement is that a, a measure must be in accordance with the law. If we're thinking of a state actor, what we think here is that the measure has a basis in the law, so it has a legislative framework, and then that, that's further informed and refined through policy. Now, obviously, that doesn't apply straightforward to non-state actors, but you can see how the, the concept of having an available policy would translate. The important thing with the in accordance with the law requirement for me 
is that it's about protection against arbitrary rights interference. So it's all about ensuring foreseeability, which in our context would be establishing when and how technology is used. Um, and ideally, of course, this should be publicly accept accessible. I would accept that there are some cases where um, you know, you might need to retain information. But for me, I think generally human rights law approach is that transparency, transparency sorry, it should be the rule um, and secrecy should be the exception. The second element of the test then is that a method should pursue a legitimate aim. And this doesn't really map on, you know, we don't think of humanitarian actors protecting national security or public order, but the assumption would be that they're acting in, in good faith. The third component then is the most important, I think, and this is the concept that a measure must be necessary in a democratic society. Uh, the important element that I would pick out for us is that when we're talking about necessity or the necessity test, this, it isn't just is the, mess, is the measure necessary to achieve my aim or is it useful to what I achieve? You know, that would be a, a narrow necessity test, but what we're talking about is necessary in a democratic society and obviously humanitarian actors and international organizations uh, don't really have a say on what the democratic society component could be, should be. But what we're at the heart of the issue is assessing the overall issue. So the overall benefit or harm of a measure and so what this is, it centers around resolving the competing interests at play. And essentially the competing interests are the claimed utility, which might be um, you know, delivering a certain product, delivering results about the promotion and protection of human rights versus the potential harm. And what the necessity test does is allows to weigh those. Um, the important element that comes from the human rights case law really demonstrates the need for an evidence base. And surprisingly, I think in a lot of the instances of technology I've studied, the evidence base is something that's missing um, and it's something that I'll come back to. Um, so in terms of claimed utility, which would be one, one half of the competing interests, um, I've centered this around a what, a why, a how, and a what else kind of approach. A lot of this, um, I think when you put it on paper, it seems very obvious, but as I said, when I've gone to, to look through different, different approaches, it's surprising how often the different components are missing and, and how, how often, I guess, high level assumptions are made. So the first component, you know, the what, is what is a, a technology intended to, to achieve? So this should set out a clear objective relevant to the specific deployment. And this protect, helps protect against mischief creep, but it also makes sure that we're spoke, focused on the specific issue at hand. You know, it's not just, for example, should we use facial recognition in a humanitarian context, but what are we specifically using facial recognition for? The second element then is why is this necessary? And that centers around the establishment of, sorry, the establishment of an appropriate evidence base. And that's really the bit that's often missing. Um, you see it an awful lot that high level assumptions are made. So thinking of a, a policing example with facial recognition, you know, there's the assumption that we need facial recognition technology to, to tackle crime or to tackle gun crime, or since I'm in London, knife crime. And the, the question is why, you know, what's the evidence to support the case that the deployment of this technology in this instance will help us achieve the objective. The third component then, the how, ties the what and the why together. And it really sets out um, how a technology will be deployed in order to achieve the aim that we know is important because of the evidence. So this comes around to the intended circumstances of use and the establishment of safeguards. So where will it be deployed? Who will have access to the data? Will the data be subject to further analysis? Will it be shared with the state? And so on. The fourth component then is about alternative mechanisms. And essentially in human rights law, we think about the idea of uh, a least intrusive means. So is there another way of doing, of achieving the same objective that will have a lesser impact um, or a lesser harm on human rights? And this can come about in a number of different ways. It could be applying the technology in a different way. So if the technology is dependent on data collection, you know, can we minimize the data collection to cause uh, lesser harm to privacy? It could be using a different technology or it could be using no technology at all. Um, the, the, the other component then of the test, uh, the potential harm, um, well, it's, it's obviously it's the flip side of the, of the question, but to, to re-emphasize the examination of any potential harm will really depend on a clear articulation of the claimed utility because unless you know 
the specific context that a technology is going to be deployed in and how it is going to be deployed, you can't evaluate the harm. Uh, this should be considered broadly. So I would consider it, uh, say, from a human rights perspective, as harm to potentially all human rights. So when we think of technologies and um, kind of AI-based technologies, typically we think of the right to privacy, but you can uh, very easily foresee that, say, if it was a surveillance-related technology, would bring into play the right to freedom of expression or potentially freedom of assembly. Um, if it's in a humanitarian context, it might bring into play the right to life or if data could potentially be shared with an abusive state, maybe the prohibition of torture. Obviously, it would also bring in issues to do with data protection law and discrimination, because we all know that discrimination is really a core part of, um, a core issue associated with technologies. But I'll finish up here shortly. You may also need to consider other forms of harm. So what's the impact on societal processes? Our informal economies. And I think the takeaway for me with all of this is that you probably need specific expertise. It's very unlikely in my experience that a UN agency or a humanitarian actor will have the, the skills and the expertise necessary to assess the full range of potential harm. Um, I think I'll leave it at that, I guess, since I see Laurel pop up. So I'm guessing I might be slightly over time. But thanks. I'm trying to be gentle, but you are. Uh... You were you're, you're gentle, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I, I just, I love the way these last two presentations really complement each other. And that makes me um, wanting more. Um, so I'm going to turn to to Wendy Wong right now um, for that. And just a reminder to please, you can start populating the Q&A um, after Wendy's presentation, then we will turn turn to Q and A and for a broader discussion. So, Wendy. Well, thank you. I have to say, I was quite, um, I, you know, very grateful for this invitation to be here with you all, and I was very excited to be part of this discussion um, with Fleur and Dara. And, and now I'm more excited, but I've got to talk about my own stuff. Um, I'm also very excited because I had many happy undergraduate years at uh, Berkeley, so I'm always glad to come back and, and do something on home turf, go Bears. Uh, so today, I think my talk is a little bit different, but very complimentary to, to the other presentations that you've heard, because I'm going to be talking about or looking at some of the problems um, that datafication poses for human rights and why we have to focus our energies on the fundamental values that human rights are trying to protect if we are going to enjoy human rights effectively in the digital age. So my comments are coming um, from a general audience book I'm, I'm working on that is going to be published by MIT Press next year with the working title, We the Data. Um, this may change in the next 10 to 11 months, we'll see, but right now that's the title um, I'm going with. So I'm, I'm going to give a really broad brushstroke view of what this book is going to be about um, and, and answer anything that is not clear in the Q&A, hopefully. So before I start today, so when I say the word data, and you've heard other presenters talk about data, what I mean about data is not just digital data, um, but that this data, um, these data are about or from people, so a specific type of digital data. And this has been called datafication in the media and science and technology studies worlds and in other places now as we've caught on to this vernacular. Um, but you know, a lot has been written about this, about thinking about the centrality of data in our lives. And I know this is a crowd where I don't have to belabor this point at all, so I won't. But I, I do wanna say that the ubiquity of digital data are, are really becoming difficult to ignore. Um, in some of the obvious ways we have in terms of thinking about social media, our online searches, our smart devices, but there are many more non-obvious ways that we should be thinking about how data are being collected about us. So whether that's through apps, um, through our, our you know, cookies on websites and other online applications, our behaviors on and offline with or without our, you know, with our devices in particular, or just in thinking about data in our transactions, credit cards or loyalty cards or that sort of behavior. So this is the datafication of our lives. This marks a fundamental shift from the world that human beings have occupied previously um, in the sense that there are increasingly scarce areas of our lives which are not being recorded, which are not being archived, pooled and sorted data about us and people like us. 
So data are capturing all of our basic life functions and it is creating an approximation, not just of our individual lives, but our collective lives as a, as a species. So given this reality, uh, what I want to talk about today uh, is some of the characteristics of data that make them different and why these matters, why these matter for key human rights concerns. So the argument I'll be making is that data create a unique challenge for human rights because of their stickiness and their identification makes human rights all the more important because of the, because data are sticky and how this stickiness changes even some of the most established rights we already hold. Um, and, and you know, others have talked a little bit about that. Okay, so the first thing is that data are sticky. And what I mean by that is data are sticky like gum on the bottom of your shoe. It's really easy to step on gum. It's really hard to take it off. So you think about that in terms of thinking about data. It's really easy to generate data about your activities, but it's not so easy to be rid of those data. Or sometimes we don't even know about the creation of those data for four important reasons. So first of all, we know, um, it, before I get into those reasons, that data are easily copied and transferred. In the, in the language of econ, um, economists, we call that non-rival and only partially excludable. These are important qualities that make data both useful and problematic. And so it also creates a stickiness around them. So one of the big reasons that data are sticky is because the data that are being collected are quite mundane. Um, they're not remarkable. They're not even in the grand scheme of things all that interested, which actually makes them more invasive, I would argue. So it's not just about boring choices like what's in our Amazon order or, or how long we're out jogging, but all the little things about our devices, all the locations and the behavioral quirks in our interactions with our, our tech. So the mundaneness of data collected demonstrates that not just that everyday values have uh, value when collected across the population, but increasingly all of these mundane things that we do are being analyzed and categorized and generating predictions, uh, used to generate predictions. And I think these are the things we used to call simply maybe private or even boring everyday activities. So that's what makes data see in the first place. And the second place data are linked. So data from one organization or, or collected by one organization on your activities doesn't just stay within the bounds of that organization. In fact, the data that we generate have social and economic value. And so these data are sold and resold to interested companies um, or interested parties by companies for profit. And because data are relatively cheap to grab, um, there is a, a, a tendency to grab as much data as possible from nearly every source. Um, so when we think about linking data, we can see some of the positive benefits as, as you know, Flores presentation shows um, some of the, the technological innovations with regard to linking all kinds of different data. And there are potentials for other areas such as medical research. But we have to weigh those possibilities or those positive possibilities against concerns around data safety, of course, but then also the implications of a collecting and pooling all kinds of sensitive information about individuals that can be used for other things, such as to deny them insurance, to raise insurance rates, or otherwise discriminate against certain conditions and therefore certain people. So the third dimension by which data are sticky is that they are as good as or effectively forever. And that's because of what I said at the outset, right? Which is that data about our lives can easily transfer between users. It's easy to copy, it's easy to replicate. It's very difficult to verify deletion of data, um, even after we close accounts or we ask data be deleted because of the fact that, it is easily that data are easily copied and transferable. So it's effectively forever. And finally, um, and this is the, an idea that really, I think causes a lot of challenges for some basic ideas around, um, you know, whose data, who, who does data, who do data belong to? Uh, this is this idea of co-creation. And so this is the idea that you are the source of data, but someone else is collecting that data to begin with. So new data are, all, are always created through a co-creation or collaboration between a data collector, often a company, and the source of data, which is all of us. So without either of these parties, there would be no data. And so 
you know, this co-creation causes problems for thinking about, especially in human rights yeah. terms, whose data these are, are they yours? Or are they the companies? Or is there a way to think about some sort of split? Uh, beyond the sort of data source and data collector distinction, I also want to draw attention to the fact that many of the data that we think of as, quote, personal, are actually very collective in nature. So whether we think about this explicitly, such as when someone posts a group photo with you in it, or the way that data are sorted to create categories of people like you. So when data about us are created, they're not being created in isolation, and they have both collective and individual implications. So that's really the four reasons why data are sticky. And so now I want to talk about how we, we can apply human rights to think about some of the, the human implications of, of datafication. So you know, human rights are a huge topic, and like any big topic, they're hard to fit into a box. And, you know, um, the basic definition, of course, is that they're the rights one has for being human. And they've become so, you know, so central in the discourse of democratic and global politics that some people have labeled human rights the lingua franca of international politics or the basis of state sovereignty and state legitimacy. So since some of us in this audience are human rights lawyers or scholars, we'll all be familiar with, you know, the specific protection to which we're all entitled by law or declaration. But what I want us to think about, what I want us to, what I want to encourage us to think about, and really the focus in my book, is not about the specific rights that are being violated and changed by datafication per se. And you know, lots of folks have talked about how our right to privacy, how you know, constant surveillance or freedom of expression is being challenged in the in the digital age. And those are really important. And, uh, concerns because these are central and well-established rights in the way we think about human rights. So we should be concerned about those specific rights. But on the other hand, what I want us to focus on is not on these individual articles and rights, but the reasons for human rights to begin with, or the values that are embedded in all human rights. So on this slide is a depiction of Cassin's Porto. As many of you know, René Cassin was a French diplomat and lawyer and an integral member of the committee that drafted the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. It's often called the UDHR. And this is, of course, one of the key documents for international human rights. And one of the great contributions of Kassan uh, was providing the internal logic of how all the rights enumerated in the UDHR fit together. And so his invention is called the Porto which is depicted here. Hassan showed how different human rights articles covered different areas of human life, acting as pillars holding up the roof, which binds us all together. Now, I want to point to actually the foundation of this portico. Right? Importantly, the portico identifies four values, dignity, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. These are the values upon which the whole portico rests and it undergirds the entire human rights project or framework. And so these four values together are really where I think our human rights efforts really need to focus when we think about how we can use human rights to think about datafication and how we can, and, and datafication's role in, in human life. So what I argue in the book is that stickiness of data changes or hurts our abilities to exercise autonomy and dignity. How data sticks to us is a question, not only for equality, but equity of the human condition. And finally, I think when we think about brotherhood, um, what I call community to update this term for our times, um, there are lots of implications for community in our age of data. And we just don't have easy answers for dealing with how data intensive technology impair social coherence, um, and, and we, you know, there are lots of examples to think through with that. So the scales of power in terms of where data about us goes and how much data gets taken from our activities, this is currently balanced towards data collectors, typically firms, but also governments. We as data sources don't have a lot of recourse at the moment because our individual capacities are infinitesimal compared to the pooled data and AI powered analysis of collectors. So that's one, one concern. We also have to come to terms with the collective nature of data 
and how individual choices for what we might think of as our data have implications for many others who may not agree. We may not ever be able to claim rights to data about us because of the co-creative aspect of data. And also because some data are simply inherently shared. So think about DNA and the millions of people who have used services like 23andMe and their millions of relatives who may or may not know about this use, but those data now exist. But I argue it doesn't have to be this way necessarily. One factor that must be developed um, in, in the book, and I talk about this in the book, is the right to data literacy, just as we have in terms of the right to education and what it means, or what education means in terms of linguistic and numeric literacy. So I argue that having a right to data literacy means we are, we are going to be recognizing how important data have become to our species and how integral it has become in our lives. So data literacy has to do with understanding how data are created, what kinds of social, political, and other values are embedded in data, and the implications for data usage for us as individuals. Now, following on this idea of data literacy, I think we need to consider the true significance of private entities, corporations like Meta, explicitly making human rights affecting decisions about what happens on their platforms. So beyond the rules and the way that they govern, um, the, the algorithms govern what we see, Meta also has a, a, an oversight board. And this oversight board explicitly states that its goal is to protect freedom of expression on all of Meta's platforms, which includes Facebook and Instagram. But if you look at the cases that appear before this board, there are actually a multiplicity of rights that these decisions end up touching on, which shows how interdependent human rights are. And they're not, they're not piecemeal. And so to think about how, we need to think about these rights not in isolation, you know, just freedom of, of expression, but also thinking about how other rights are affected because of um, the companies that, are, that, that, that serve as the platforms or service platforms for how we communicate. And so these are really important implications as big tech becomes uh, become global governors of human rights through their technologies. Um, but at the same time, they don't have the same official roles or status when it comes to obligations to protect human rights as states do. So this is a big concern. And my final concern is about the fact that data are, are practically forever, at least insofar as we can't verify that they aren't. And so, we'll, and so the implication is that we have to think about uh, the human implications for having these data floating around about our very most mundane uh, behaviors. And that these technologies are already out there for, or there are technologies already out there for recreating people based on data about them. And so this is not something that's gonna go away um, and, and will remain a question we have to grapple with. So, thanks. Thank you. And thanks to all the panelists. This is uh, um, really a feast of ideas. So I invite everyone to, turn their cameras back on. Um, and we have some great questions that, that we'll get into in, in, in just a moment. I wanted to open it up first and let the panelists just respond to a general question, which is, it seems to me that a, a current that runs through all of your um, presentations is sort of, is this tension between our cognition and individual agency and the problems that data are creating as they intersect in our lives. Whether it's, you know, who controls um, artificial intelligence, who has this data, how we even, um, you know, Floor's presentation is so provocative, how we, like, cognitively, how we even understand uh, how data is shaping how we think about things may be um, we may need some additional interventions to even understand what it is we are no longer seeing and how our understandings of things are narrowed. And so it's a very broad question, but I would invite the panelists to, to, to respond from, from your perspective of this issue of like where, at what levels do you think would you prioritize interventions? Is this about giving individuals greater information and control over data? Is this, uh, is the intervention, do we need different kinds of regulations so that we, so that individuals are protected from, I mean, I, fr from our own ignorance or 
or, or disregard for what it means not to click that box and say, don't track my location, right? I mean, generationally, very different sensitivities around privacy with maybe an inadequate understanding of what that happens. Um, and then third, at the international level, because of the portability, and because of the multiplicity of institutions that really are involved in governance, you know, how do we prioritize thinking about that? Um, and, and, and as a final caution, please avoid answers that say we need to do all of those things. Um, <laughs> if you had to, uh, you know, where from your perspective uh, should the priorities be? And so hopefully you have different priorities and, and that will lead to some interesting responses. And any any one of you can can start off. Well, perhaps I'll I'll leap in. Um, so I don't have a good answer, Laurel, because these are vast questions, and as Dara said, it's difficult to address them in the abstract. Um, that different applications and different um, different um, manifestations of these transformations really um, suggest different answers. But I would, I guess, I, I'm thinking of the sort of scale of the response, um, and I think we can learn a lot from historical inquiry. So I think a lot of our law and legal and political architecture is expressive of two. Um, what might be thought of as comparable shifts historically. And I'm no, I should caution that I'm no historian. So this is um, something I'm learning from reading and talking with historians. Um, one would be the, the shift towards statistical thinking. So a lot of our, if I'm thinking of the, the sort of temporal registers of law and political governance, a lot of them are oriented around practices that um, of statistics gathering and statistics generation. Um, and a lot of the way we think about accountability and auditing and so forth depend upon those practices. And I'm thinking about statistics in the kind of 19th and 20th century uh, demographic sense, the kind of classic model of the census say, rather than in computational statistics or um, the kind of statistics that get expressed in um, in uh, say Bayesian algorithms. Um, so I think we can look to how we developed new institutions and vocabularies around those kinds of shifts. The second shift would be the shift in sort of, um, again, temporality and perception that was associated with modernist literature and art. So we can think of a lot of, um, late 19th century and 20th century transformations in governance as expressing the shift in perception that was associated with new practices of writing and um, art making and music making. So where we, we developed a much more fractured, much more multivocal sense of time. And so that's how we came, I would argue, how we came to think in terms of non-state actors and 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 recognize and think of the of global governance as a manifestation of many different agents interacting continually on um, so it was associated with a shift in the practice of cultural uh, of cultural practice um, and so we can look to these other elemental shifts and say well what did we do? How do we adjust our institutions? What new institutions did we develop? What new vocabularies? Um, you know, there was a different practice of treaty making that was associated with the interwar period that was completely caught up with these cultural changes. We started to think, well, maybe we need to allow the rights of petition to minority groups because, because we were able to see them, I would argue, because in part, this cultural, these cultural practices had changed the way we see and what we see. So I, I don't think of property, I mean, obviously property and ownership are key, but I think we need to be thinking on this sort of scale of transformation, that it's not just about developing this measure here or um, this kind of form of consent to, um, or this, uh, this corrective, that it's, it's really a wholesale shift. 
and that we need to look to these early historical periods for guidance of what might be possible, what we could um, imagine doing and how our basic practices of legal and government uh, and legal and political interaction and relation might be um, thought about in new ways. So it is really the question, the answer that you said you didn't want, which is we need to change everything. I, can I, I mean, I can't agree more with what you just said, Floor, in a way, but then also thinking about, I mean, you're absolutely right, looking at historical analogs, which is something that you know, I've done in thinking about how AI and, and datafication changes the way we think about ourselves and how we know things, right? That's a really important social and political shift that we're still coming to terms with. I think the one sort of, my one hesitation there is thinking about the speed and the scale at which these changes are happening. So far faster than a lot of the historical analogies we can draw on. So what do we do with that? And I, and I think about just the, you know, the totalizing force of some of these data intensive technologies and what's being collected. Yeah, which is not just to say that there's an urgency with which we need to, to act. And I, you know, in some ways I'm tempted to, to give Floor's answer, but I'll try to be more specific. I think there are two things that, I, you know, in addition to what I said about data literacy, I think that is a really important skill that many of us don't have. And I'm not saying we should all be data scientists far from that. I think we should all be much more aware in, in, in terms of how data, the biases that enter data, the types of data that are being collected and making huge inferences about individuals and collectives and then shaping our lives accordingly. Um, and so, so data literacy from a policymaker's perspective, from an individual's perspective, and I think this is, you know, individuals need that kind of, of skill and that capacity, but societies need that too, writ large, in order to, to write smarter policy. Um, I think the other immediate thing that that needs to happen is the training of human rights for for engineers and for for computer scientists and other technologists to actually take this as a serious concern, not after the fact, not hiring some human rights specialist who gets you know shuffled away in the corner of, of the office, but everyone needs to be thinking about the implications of their their work and what types of apps they're developing for us. Um, and, and and really right. foregrounding human rights concerns in the way that Dara really highlighted in his presentation. Um, yeah, it's hard to follow the two of you. Um, I'll be very quick. I think two elements of your your question, Laurel. I think it absolutely shouldn't be on the individual because that's impossible. And I think the only way to deal with these issues is at the multilateral level or at the state level. You know, they're global issues, and we just. Uh, yeah, even within the state, it's difficult. The other thing then in terms of maybe the shift in thinking that, that Fleur was talking about, for me, uh, and maybe perhaps controversial to say as a human rights lawyer, I think we need to stop focusing on the individuals and individual effects exclusively because the balance of power essentially has shifted. You know, the ability of state or non-state actors to gain a, an absolute, absolutely, sorry, excuse me, a knackered, tired, <laughs> absolutely massive insight into into our lives and the ability to influence um influence our lives you know the opportunities that are open to us the information that we access that's now exerting effects essentially at a societal level and i think say from a human rights law perspective we need to you know we always talk about the interconnectedness and interdependence of human rights but that's about where the thinking on it ends you know that's not a lot of work goes into what that actually means and i think particularly if you think of uh, what Wendy was talking about, about like data stickiness and datafication, and um, that for me all comes back to like the chilling effect of surveillance and what the use of that data will have on our ability to develop our identities. And if an individual can't develop their identity fully, then we don't have a functioning democracy. So it's really thinking about the the societal sorry impacts. Thank you all. Um, you've moved more than exceeded, I think any any moderators expectations and i'm sure the audience because you uh, each of you i want to thank you for really engaging deeply with that question and my subversive aim in asking it was 
then not to, uh, I knew we would run out of time and we weren't gonna be able to ask individual questions, but by asking a big meaty question, I think that you gave answers to the more detailed questions that were in, in the Q and A. Um, and so with that, I just, I, I wanna thank the sponsors. I wanna thank the moderators. I wanna thank the excellent tech support and the audience for, for sticking with us. We're one minute over, so I'm gonna gift you that back. Dara, um, sweet dreams, wherever you are from your- from I have your to dungeon. cycle home, I'm terrified. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope they, yeah, and may, it, and, and may it be an easy evening, rest of the evening. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Take care.